Hello, this is Dr. John Dufton, and welcome to my webinar entitled Understanding and Managing Erectile Dysfunction, which we'll refer to as ED. After the completion of this one-hour presentation, the viewer should be able to describe the cause, frequency, and implications of ED, outline the non-pharmacological methods used to treat ED, and compare and contrast the most common medications used to manage ED, including mechanisms of action and any potential side effects. Erectile dysfunction is the chronic inability to achieve or sustain an erection firm enough for sexual intercourse. The key there is chronic inability. Not being able to get, a, to get an erection one evening does not qualify as erectile dysfunction. It used to be more commonly referred to as impotency, but the medical community now prefers the term erectile dysfunction. ED is fairly common, especially as men age, but sexual dysfunction should never be considered normal, despite being common, at any age. As you can imagine, ED has a significant impact on the quality of life of both sufferers and their partners. ED is different from other sexual issues, such as lack of libido, or sexual desire, or difficulty ejaculating. To achieve an erection, the following actions must occur. First, there must be a stimulus from the brain. In other words, there must be some kind of a sexual interest and this culminates into chemical cascades. Then, the nerves that run from the brain down the spinal cord and out to the penis must function properly. Then the arterial blood supply to the penis must be adequate. In other words, enough blood must be able to fill up the penis. Finally, the veins within the penis must be able to trap the blood which keeps the erection hard. If there is something interfering with any of these, whether it be a, an accident, an injury, a disease, a psychological issue, then a firm erection is prevented. The diagram to the right shows some of the main structures of the penis, including the dorsal vein and the various cavernous arteries. An erection occurs when two tubular-like structures that run the length of the penis become engorged with blood. Individually, they're known as the corpus cavernosum. On the diagram to the right, you can see the two upper corpus cavernosum. They're partially separated by a septum, lots of cavernosal spaces, and they're fed by cavernosal arteries. The corpus spongiosum, which is a single tube located below the corpora cavernosa, that's plural, that contain the ure urethra, may also become engorged with blood, but the corpus spongiosum contributes less to a firm erection than do the corpora cavernosa. And you can see in the diagram to the right the urethra is in the middle of the corpus spongiosum. And this explains why it's very difficult for a man to urinate while he has an erection. It basically pinches off the urethra and makes it difficult for the bladder to empty. Although during ejaculation, because of the smooth mu muscle contractions, semen is able to exit the urethra despite an erection. As an interesting side note, ejaculation doesn't require an erection. Physical issues cause most cases of ED, at least 80%, especially in older men. Examples include blood vessel diseases, especially atherosclerosis or clogged arteries, but also venous leakage, nerve damage,
caused by spinal trauma or cerebral stroke, and other diseases that affect nerves, such as multiple sclerosis, ALS, also known as Lou Gehrig's disease, Alzheimer's, or Parkinson's disease. Chronic illness is a common physical cause of ED, including cancer, diabetes, chronic kidney and liver diseases. Diabetes is a physical cause of ED because high levels of glucose in the blood is toxic and destructive to small nerves and blood vessels. Physical side effects from medications, alcoholism, and drug abuse are also significant causes of ED. ED can also be caused by damage to the penis, such as from blunt trauma, surgical side effect, or Peyronie's disease, which is an accumulation of scar tissue that leads to painful erections. Surgeries that can certainly damage the penis include prostate gland surgery, and also surgeries to enlarge the penis or aesthetically shape it, which are becoming much more common. Obesity, hormonal imbalance, and metabolic syndrome are also possible physical causes of ED. Diabetes is the most common physical cause of erectile dysfunction. And as you can see to the pie chart, to the right, it's estimated that 40% the physical causes of ED is due to diabetes. The next most common physical cause is vascular disease, in particular atherosclerosis. But obviously there is a relationship between diabetes and vascular problems, because as I noted, glucose, high levels of glucose in the blood is very toxic and destructive to blood vessels and nerves. Other physical causes on this pie chart includes radical surgery. Radical surgery in this sense means removal of the prostate gland because of excessive benign growth or because of prostate cancer. Spinal cord injury estimated to be 8%. Endocrine disorders in particular problems with glands such as the thyroid, adrenal glands, etc. And of course we have MS at about 3%, which is much more common in more northerly latitudes. Psychological factors are responsible for between 10 and 20% of ED, meaning that they're the sole causes of between 10 and 20% although they can obviously compound any physical causes. And of course, strictly physical causes will eventually lead to some psychological issues with time. Examples of psychological factors include excessive stress, depression, other mental health issues, for example, schizophrenia, poor self-esteem, and of course, a very common one is simple performance anxiety. And this is being compounded and increased over the years because of the increase in pornography material. So men that watch pornography, watch the porn stars in action, are much more likely to suffer performance anxiety in their own sexual situations. Essentially, any lifestyle choice that impairs blood flow or damages nerves dramatically increases the risk for ED. The most common ones include tobacco smoking. In fact, smokers have twice the risk of ED compared to non-smokers. Tobacco smoke contains various carcinogens, but it also contains compounds that damage blood vessels and nerve fibers. Chronic alcoholism is a very common cause associated with ED, but so is binge drinking even just for one evening, as most men are aware of. 
The irony is that drinking alcohol often increases libido, and it also reduces inhibitions, but it's a central nervous system depressant, so it kind of causes a bit of a disconnect below the waist, if you get my meaning. Illicit drug abuse is associated with higher incidence of ED, in particular the use of amphetamines, cocaine, and marijuana. Using prescription meds can also increase your risk of ED, and the drugs most commonly associated with ED are antidepressants, antihistamines, analgesics, or painkillers, and medications used to control hypertension. Obesity and lack of exercise are also lifestyle factors, as is cycling. In fact, avid cyclers suffer more ED because the bike seat puts pressure on the perineum, which contains blood vessels and nerves that feed the penis. Avid cyclists also suffer much higher incidence of prostate problems, including benign hypertrophy and prostate cancer. Lack of sleep often causes chronic fatigue, which can lead or trigger ED, primarily because of the lack of energy, which reduces libido, and also the associated hormonal imbalance. Many issues can result from ED, including an unsatisfactory sex life, the inability to get a partner pregnant, although keep in mind an erection is not necessary for ejaculation. Mental and, let's say, emotional stimulation is really the primary ingredient. Marital and relationship problems are common. Compounding stress and anxiety from the workplace or from raising kids, etc. ED also usually leads to a continual or chronic feelings of embarrassment in men which of course is tied hand in hand with low self-esteem. Because of these feelings, low self-esteem, depression and embarrassment, there is an increased risk of drug and alcohol abuse for those men who suffer from ED. According to the Massachusetts Male Aging Study, approximately 40% of men experienced some degree of erectile dysfunction at age 40. And this is compared to 70% of men at age 70 that report at least some degree of ED. And keep in mind that to be diagnosed as ED, there has to be a bit of an established pattern, not just one night of binge drinking, for example. Overall, about 52% of American men have some sort of ED. You can look at the bar graph to the right. In blue, that's the 52%. In other words, 48% of American men apparently do not suffer from ED, or at least they don't report it. Within the 52% of men that do, 25% report or are diagnosed as having moderate levels of ED. And I guess a loose definition of moderate could be failure to achieve an erection greater than 50% of the time, although less than 90% of the time. 10% of American men either are diagnosed with or report complete erectile dysfunction, which is total failure, at least 90% of the time, if not 100% of the time. And then 17% of American men are diagnosed with or report minimal erectile dysfunction. And again, it's a rather loose definition, but usually it's failure to achieve erection up to 50% of the time. Beyond 50% is usually categorized as moderate ED. Keep in mind that these definitions of mild, moderate, and severe are relatively subjective because for some men maybe not getting an erection 10% of the time is a disaster. It's a serious problem for them. 
Whereas in other men, not getting an erection 10% of the time may be considered completely normal and fine. So this is a subjective issue to a certain extent, and these definitions are not set in stone. Having said that, moderate to severe erectile dysfunction does dramatically increase with age. There's about a 20% incidence of men, this is American men by the way, between the ages of 50 to 55. Moderate to severe ED increases to 48% incidence for men between the ages of 60 to 65. And it's about 82% for men between the ages of 70 to 75. And again, we can see in the diagram below how that dramatically increases. There seems to be a slightly different prevalence of ED among racial and ethnic groups. For example, some research indicates that Hispanic and Asian men appear to have increased risk of moderate levels of ED compared to African Americans or Caucasians of European ancestry. On the other hand, Asian and African American men are least likely to be diagnosed or to suffer from severe ED. African American men are also least likely to report ED issues. So the actual prevalence is difficult to gauge in relation to other ethnic groups. Obviously many factors are involved here, not just skin color has to do with cultural habits, dietary factors, etc. Well, let's take a minute now to summarize the major common risk factors for ED. Being older than 50 years of age, regardless of ethnicity, is certainly a major risk factor. Having diabetes, hypertension or high blood pressure, high cholesterol, which is also linked to higher risk of atherosclerosis. Low testosterone levels, which we'll get into more in detail in the next few slides. Smoking, of course, as we mentioned earlier, smokers have twice the risk compared to non-smokers. Cardiovascular disease in general, not just atherosclerosis, but other issues with the heart. And of course, depression. These are the major risk factors for ED. As I alluded to in a previous slide, there is a difference of opinion on the criteria for diagnosing ED. In other words, it's quite subjective. Some doctors and men believe that any difficulty achieving and maintaining an erection is indicative of ED and is problematic. Other medical sources define ED as not being able to achieve or maintain a firm erection at least 75% of the time they attempt sex over the course of many weeks or months. I think all of us would agree that 75% of the time is a major problem, but some of us believe that even 10% of the time would be a big problem. In summary, it depends mainly on the man who suffers from ED and if and when they seek diagnosis or treatment as to whether or not a diagnosis of ED is agreed upon. As an interesting aside, a significant percentage of men would rather claim they have ED or jump through all the medical hoops associated with ED rather than admit they are simply no longer attracted to their mates. Strange but true. Not being attracted to your mate, or having a naturally low libido, is not considered a cause of ED, but it is certainly a sign or symptom of another form of sexual dysfunction. A testosterone blood test is ordered for infertile men and those with reduced libido or erectile dysfunction. Again, men have different levels of sexual interest and libido, and some men just naturally 
have lower libido, despite the fact that they have normal levels of testosterone. However, testosterone can become a factor if low levels are directly associated with low libido. Causes of low testosterone include hypothalamic or pituitary diseases, genetic diseases such as Klinefelter's syndrome, or damaged testes from direct trauma or infections such as mumps. The main symptoms of low testosterone, aside from potentially the inability to achieve an erection and having low libido, are lack of a beard and body hair, decreased muscle mass and fatty accumulation around the midsection, and possible development of breast tissue, which is called gynecomastia. Before ordering any tests, your doctor should perform a medical history and a physical exam. It's possible that a psychological referral may also be included, especially if depression or other mental health issues is obvious. Because there are many different causes of ED, there are several different lab tests that may be useful. For example, a CBC or complete blood count, looking for anemia, which is indicated by low levels of red blood cells or abnormal red blood cell formation, low levels of hemoglobin and iron, but also looking for infection, which would be characterized by increased levels of white blood cells. Liver and kidney function tests, of course, checking for the function, possible disease of these organs. Lipid profile, high levels of triglycerides and other lipids may indicate a higher risk of atherosclerosis. Thyroid function test, thyroid hormones such as thyroxin do help regulate production of sex hormones such as testosterone. A blood hormone study is a general test, but of course testosterone and prolactin levels would be most relevant here. A urine analysis may be helpful. You'd be looking at protein, glucose, white blood cell and testosterone levels. Of course high levels of glucose is associated with possible diabetes. PSA test, prostate specific antigen you're looking for there, which is indicative of some kind of pathology of the prostate gland, whether it be benign hypertrophy or prostate cancer. And of course problems with the prostate do affect the ability to get an erection because of the proximity of the gland to the male penis. Sometimes more specialized testing is needed to figure out the cause of ED. Duplex ultrasound. This is useful to evaluate blood flow and check for signs of a venous leak. But also atherosclerosis or potential excessive tissue scarring which is the case with Peyronie's disease. Nocturnal Penile tumescence, or NPT. This measures erectile function while you're asleep. Normally men should have five, possibly six erections while they sleep. Fewer than these numbers, or no erections during nighttime, may indicate nerve function or circulation issues. A penile biothesiometry involves the use of electromagnetic vibration to determine sensitivity. If a man cannot feel these vibrations, that's indicative of reduced nerve function. Vasoactive injection. An erection is produced by injecting a special solution that causes the blood vessels to dilate, which allows blood to enter the penis. Vasoactive injections are often combined with ultrasound studies. The dynamic infusion cavernosometry. This is used for men that are diagnosed with ED to determine the severity of a venous leak. 
So fluid is pumped into the penis at a predetermined rate, and it's measured how quickly it flows out. Dye can be added to this fluid, and then x-rays can be taken also. Erection issues less than 20% of the time are not unusual in the American population, and treatment is not typically recommended by most doctors. But again, it depends on the doctor, it depends on the man suffering from the erectile problem. Erection problems greater than 50% of the time certainly indicates there is a serious problem requiring treatment. Treatment options include the following general categories. Psychotherapy, in, the term, in terms of psychoanalysis or general counseling. Natural remedies, it's a big category, but includes herbs, vitamins, and other supplements. Vacuum devices, commonly known as pumps. Drug therapy, of course. And as a last resort, surgical procedures. Psychological factors directly cause or initiate between 10 to 20 percent of ED. But purely physical causes eventually lead to more psychological or emotional issues such as depression and anxiety. So after a period of time, the physical goes hand in hand with the psychological and they are very difficult to determine which came first. It's a bit of a chicken versus the egg sort of dilemma. Psychological counseling sessions typically focus on relationship difficulties, performance anxiety, which seems to be much more common in men who view or read excessive pornography, work problems and stress, financial troubles, which of course are much more common in times of so-called economic downturns. Poor self-image certainly plays a role, as does drug and alcohol dependency. Well, let's start with an overview of the natural remedies that can be used and are used to treat ED. There are a variety of natural treatments and approaches such as lifestyle change. In other words, quit smoking, Reduce intake of alcoholic beverages. For men, the maximum recommended daily intake is two alcoholic drinks per day. Exercising more, losing weight, controlling blood glucose levels, and managing stress would all fall under lifestyle changes. Herbal remedies. It's important to note that none are really accepted by mainstream medicine or the FDA but the vast majority are safe, time-proven, and relatively inexpensive. We'll get into that more in the next slide. Homeopathic tinctures. These are often based on herbs or minerals. Homeopathy is, uh, I wouldn't say, uh, accepted by mainstream medicine, but it's certainly been around and a competitor for mainstream medicine since the mid to late 1800s. Nutritional supplements. These include amino acids, bioflavonoids, vitamins, minerals, and hormones such as DHEA. I'll get more into this in the following slide. And another natural remedy that can sometimes be used for ED is acupuncture, which in general promotes healthy nerve and blood flow which are obviously two big factors in ED. Chinese, African, and many other cultures have long used herbs to treat erectile dysfunction. But these remedies are usually not well studied by American researchers. Common herbal remedies include Korean red ginseng, which is considered the most potent form of ginseng, it helps regulate so-called yang energy in the body, which can boost vitality and stamina, combat fatigue, enhance libido, and help with ED depending on its cause. Ashwagandha is sometimes called Indian ginseng. I'm referring to 
East India, not Native American Indian, because it has similar effects, although there is no research regarding ED. Common side effects of ashwagandha include drowsiness, so it shouldn't be combined with other sedatives, either natural or drug-based. Ginkgo biloba, this is a vasodilator and blood thinner that increases blood flow and relaxes smooth mus muscle tissue. It's also a good antioxidant. Some studies do show that ginkgo is particularly effective for ED caused by antidepressant drug use. Yohimbe bark, which is from certain varieties of trees common in Africa, it contains about 6% of a compound called yohimbine, which stimulates pelvic nerves, dilates blood vessels, and increases heart rate. In fact, a 1998 Journal of Urology meta-analysis found that yohimbine induces erections in 30% of men with erectile dysfunction by increasing blood flow to the penis and stimulating their libidos. Yohimbe bark is potentially dangerous in larger doses because it can cause severe drop in blood pressure, dizziness, hallucinations, and paralysis. In this sense, Yohimbe bark is relatively unusual as a herbal remedy because of its potential for serious side effects. Because the vast majority of herbal remedies are very safe and lead to very minor or no side effects. Horny goatweed. This is mainly an aphrodisiac, but it's also used for erectile dysfunction. The leaves contain flavonoids, polysaccharides, sterols, and an alkaloid called magnafluorine. Horny goatweed's mechanism of action is still largely unknown. And we can see pictures of these herbal remedies to the right. Yohimbe bark is typically reddish colored. And it's usually the leaves of the horny goat weed that are used medicinally. Homeopathic tinctures are made by diluting herbal, mineral, or metallic solutions and then fixing them in alcohol. And by diluting, I mean really dilute. Most homeopathic tinctures have one part per million, one part per hundred million. In a sense, homeopathic tinctures are probably best regarded as vibrational therapies rather than herbal because so little of the herb remains in the tinctures. Some common ones used for ED include Argentum nitricum. This apparently is most effective in men who are worried, anxious, hurried, and very warm-blooded. Caladium this is indicated for men who are completely unable to get an erection despite having a strong libido. Selenium metallicum. This is supposedly indicated for men who experience erectile dysfunction after suffering a serious illness or a very high fever. Staphysagria. Indicated for ED if physical or emotional abuse play important roles. Lycopodium. This may be most effective for older men, especially those who also suffer from benign prostatic hypertrophy. Varita carbonica may be helpful for premature ejaculation combined with ED. DHEA is a steroidal hormone produced by the adrenal glands which sit atop your kidneys. The body converts DHEA into male and female sex hormones, such as testosterone and estrogen. It may help some men with ED, especially if they have low testosterone levels, and that can be established as the cause of the ED. Some research shows that low DHEA levels are common among men with ED, particularly those guys younger than 60 years of age. However, it does not appear to benefit ED if it's caused by diabetes or nerve issues such as MS. The supplements are made from diostinin, which is a compound found in soy and wild yams. 
all supplements were taken off the market in 1985 because of concerns of false claims. But DHEA was reintroduced as nutritional supplement in 1994. Long-term safety of taking DHEA supplements is unknown, so exercise some caution. Arginine is a non-essential amino acid used to make nitric oxide, which is a chemical that signals smooth muscle to relax and allows blood vessels, especially arteries, to dilate. Some research has concluded that arginine, at doses between 1,500 and 5,000 milligrams daily for up to six weeks, improves erectile dysfunction, which is why it's sometimes called natural Viagra. However, high doses of arginine may stimulate the body's production of gastrin, a hormone that increases stomach acidity. So high doses are not appropriate for people with gastric ulcers. Arginine may also alter potassium levels if taken in large doses, especially in people with liver disease. Arginine is commonly found in a wide variety of foods, such as meat, poultry, fish, and dairy. For those biochemists in the crowd, there is a molecular depi depiction of arginine to the right. Carnitine is a substance that helps turn fat into energy, and it's also a fairly powerful antioxidant which combats atherosclerosis. Some studies suggest that supplemental forms of carnitine, in particular propionyl L-carnitine and acetyl L-carnitine, enhance the effectiveness of Viagra, which results in improved erectile function. Propionyl L-carnitine plus Viagra may be significantly more effective than taking Viagra alone. Carnitine is also effective for erectile dysfunction caused by diabetes. Doses of carnitine are about 2,000 milligrams daily for up to six months. And those 2,000 milligrams are typically broken up into two or three doses per day. Other nutritional supplements used to treat ED naturally include bioflavonoids, zinc, magnesium, vitamins C and E, and flaxseed products. Vacuum devices improve the firmness of erections by increasing blood flow to the penis. Vacuum devices are available with or without a prescription. Approximately 80% of men who use a vacuum device are able to obtain an erection hard enough for sexual intercourse. Vacuum erection devices, usually abbreviated as VEDs, are typically made of three parts. One part is a clear plastic tube that slides over the penis. Another important part is manual or battery-operated pump that sucks air out of the plastic cylinder. And of course, this draws in more blood to the penis. The third major component of these vacuum devices is some sort of an elastic ring that's placed around the base of the penis after an erection is obtained, which prevents the blood from escaping from the penis. On the downside, vacuum devices are typically cumbersome and they compromise spontaneity. Furthermore, the elastic rings may lead to irritation, bruising, or pain. The most common oral meds prescribed to men with ED are called phosphodiesterase type 5 inhibitors. And they include sildenafil, Brand, brand name Viagra, which is still the most commonly sold PDE5 inhibitor. Tadalafil, brand name Cialis, which has the longest half-life and lasts the longest. Vardenafil, brand names Levitra or Staxin. And the newest one, called Avanafil, brand name Stendra, which has the fastest onset and was approved by the FDA in 2012. 
Other less common and less effective oral meds for ED include taking antidepressants, such as trazodone. The main non-oral alternative for ED is called alprostadil, which is available as an injection or suppository. All PDE5 inhibitors work similarly. That is, they enhance the effects of nitric oxide, which I've, I've described as a chemical that relaxes smooth muscles in the penis and increases blood flow. Approximately 80% of men who take PDE5 inhibitors, as directed, have firmer and longer lasting erections. However, these types of drugs do not stimulate libido or impact testosterone levels. PDE5 inhibitors are typically taken by mouth about one hour or possibly 45 minutes before wanting to have sex and they should not be used more than once a day. Viagra, Levitra, and Stendra last about 5 hours, although Cialis can work up to 36 hours because its half-life is much longer. With the exception of Staxin, which dissolves in the mouth and has a quicker onset, most other PDE5 inhibitors are swallowed in pill form. Combining PDE5 inhibitors with blood pressure meds or nitrate drugs, such as nitroglycerin tablets for angina pain, is dangerous due to a potential fatal drop in blood pressure, so it should be avoided. The most common side effects of using PDE5 inhibitors include headache, runny nose, dizziness, flushing, which is particularly common with Viagra and Levitra use, muscle aches and back pain, which is more common with Cialis use, and strange blue-green visual shading, sometimes referred to as blue vision, which is most commonly seen with Viagra and Levitra use. The main reason why PDE5 inhibitors lead to headache and flushing is because they dilate blood vessels. If depression is the predominant cause of erectile dysfunction, then various antidepressant meds may be indicated. But ironically, reduced libido is a common side effect of most antidepressants. However, trazodone is a serotonin antagonist and reuptake inhibitor antidepressant that also appears to possess significant stimulating effects on libido and erectile functions. So in this sense, trazodone is a bit of an unusual antidepressant. Some studies reported slightly better sexual function in men who took trazodone, but the follow-up trials are conflicting and some of the results are unconvincing. As such, current guidelines do not recommend taking trazodone for the treatment of ED. If oral PDE5 inhibitors, such as Viagra, do not significantly impact the erectile dysfunction, or perhaps the PDE5 inhibitors can't be taken for medical reasons, then alprostadil is usually recommended. It's a powerful vasodilator that triggers an erection within minutes, and typically the erections last about an hour. Alprostadil only works if the blood flow is intact, however. Alprostadil is given in two different ways. Intracavernous injection, whereas a solution of alprostadil is injected directly into the base of the penis, no more than three times per week is recommended. And of course, after the patient learns how to do it, he is expected to do it himself each time he's interested in having sex, up to a maximum of three times per week. There's an increased risk of damage, scarring, and priapism, which is prolonged and painful erections typically lasting more than four to five hours. Another way of taking alprostadil is via suppository. 
In this case, pellets are placed into the urethra at the tip of the penis. This method is typically less successful compared to injections, although the side effects are also less. As mentioned earlier, testosterone is a male hormone or androgen produced mainly in the testicles but also in the adrenal glands. It helps maintain bone density, fat distribution, muscle strength and mass, red blood cell production, sex drive or libido, and also sperm production. The hormone peaks during adolescence and early adulthood and then gradually declines about 1% per year beyond the age of 30. About 25% of men over the age of 70 don't produce enough testosterone. Testosterone therapy, which can occur via injection or gel, is only recommended as a treatment for ED when levels are low. But again, slightly lower testosterone levels do not necessarily mean there's going to be reduced libido or erectile dysfunction. The best time to test the blood for testosterone levels is usually in the morning between the hours of 7 and 10 a.m. because testosterone levels are known to fluctuate quite significantly according to mood and dietary factors throughout the day. Surgical procedures are usually only recommended if the ED is severe enough or complete and there's no response from psychological, natural, or pharmaceutical treatments. It's a last resort. ED surgery falls into two categories. The placement of an implant, which is either inflatable or semi-rigid, and this happens usually on both sides of the penis, or vascular reconstruction surgery to improve blood flow or to reduce blood leakage from the penis and surrounding structures. As noted, there are two types of penile implants, inflatable and semi-rigid rods. The inflatable types are the most common in the United States, and they are more natural in the sense that they can be inflated to create an erection just prior to having sex, and then deflated afterwards. The diagram on the left is an example of a three-piece inflatable implant pump is within the scrotum. Sometimes to fit the pump within the scrotum, a testicle has to be removed, but that's not normally the case. There's also a fairly large fluid reservoir inserted into the lower abdomen. And then of course the two inflatables are inserted on either side of the penis. The two-piece inflatable model works in a similar way to the three-piece but the fluid reservoir is part of the pump implanted in the scrotum. The advantage of having a three-piece is that there's more fluid to pump into the penis, which can give a more firm erection. In contrast, semi-rigid rods are always firm, but the surgery is less complicated and prone to failure. Vascular reconstruction surgery involves either repairing the arterial blockages to improve blood flow into the penis or reducing the venous leakage out of the penis. Penile arterial revascularization is a procedure designed to keep blood flowing by rerouting it around blocked or injured vessels. Typically it's indicated only for young men less than the age of 45 that have no known risk factors for atherosclerosis. This surgery is aimed at correcting any vessel injury at the base of the penis caused by blunt trauma or pelvic fracture. In contrast, venous ligation surgery focuses on binding leaky penile veins that are causing penile rigidity to diminish during erections. Venous occlusion which is necessary for sufficient firmness, depends on arterial blood flow and relaxation of the spongy tissue in the penis. However, long-term success rate of this surgery is less than 50%. Like virtually every other disease, gene therapy for ED is being studied by scientists. The question is, 
what percentage of ED is related to faulty genetics. My belief is that very little of ED is related to faulty genes, although future research should be able to tell us more. Scientists are also researching whether a substance made from spider venom could help with ED also. A certain poisonous spider releases a substance from its bite that apparently triggers priapism, which is a painfully prolonged erection, typically lasting four or five hours or more. Well, let's just have a summary of some tips that may be able to reduce the risk or incidence of ED. Exercise and maintain a healthy weight. Stop smoking tobacco and marijuana. Avoid alcohol and substance abuse. For men, no more than two drinks a day, alcoholic drinks that is, is recommended. Maintain healthy blood glucose and cholesterol levels. Control high blood pressure. Take steps to reduce your stress. Suggestions include yoga, meditation, or starting a new, fun, low-stress hobby. Get truly restful sleeps at night. Be cautious when bike riding long distances. And finally, get help for anxiety or depression.